Welcome everyone to Voices Rethinking Dairy Cows. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to elders from other communities who may be here today. So my name is Elise Burgess, and I'm head of communications at Voiceless, the Animal Protection Institute. And I'm also one of the authors on our latest report, The Life of the Dairy Cow, a report on the Australian dairy industry. The result of two years' analysis of current scientific evidence and the relevant legal frameworks, this report highlights the need for immediate change in the way these emotionally complex animals are treated. For those of you who don't know, however, Voiceless is a not-for-profit think tank, and we're focused on raising awareness and alleviating the suffering of animals in two core areas within Australia, that is, factory farming and the commercial kangaroo industry. Over the years, we've fought hard to better protect hundreds of millions of animals affected within these industries, with a core focus on policy and law reform. To date, the Australian dairy industry has avoided much of the scrutiny that has been levelled at other animal industries due to this false perception of dairy being a no-harm product. See, many people believe that dairy cows live idyllic lives, naturally producing enough milk to feed their young and also provide for human consumption. However, this is not the case. In reality, the average Australian dairy cow is subject to a perpetual cycle of calving, milking and forced impregnation. She has now been bred to double, sorry, to produce double the milk she may have 30 years ago and to ensure her yield remains at its peak, she's forcibly impregnated every 13 months in, in order to produce a calf who was immediately taken away from her and in many cases, this calf is killed within one week. The emotional suffering that this process causes, along with the physical pain inflicted through standard legal mutilation practices, such as tail docking or dehorning, along with the prevalence of painful diseases, such as lameness and mastitis, all negatively impact on her welfare. Yet, these issues remain hidden from consumer view. And while all these issues are highly, highly distressing, perhaps the most concerning fact to emerge from our research was the push towards mass production. We've seen this already with the egg industry and we've seen it with the meat industries, a push for more animals, more output and more product. In dairy, this would translate to larger herd sizes and dairy cows being fed unnatural high grain diets so they produce more milk every day. We've even seen the rise of total mixed ration dairy farms. These are essentially feedlots for dairy cows. While currently in Australia it is only 2% of dairy farms that are total mixed rations, we want to make sure that these numbers don't rise. Which is why now is the time for us to rethink dairy, to rethink our role as consumers or as producers, and to think about how our demands are impacting on her, the dairy cow. And it seems our timing was right, because the response to the report has been remarkable. Voiceless has been contacted by members of the public who were shocked by the treatment of dairy cows and calves in this country. We've been supported by those who have been working hard to bring attention to this industry, but perhaps most surprisingly and most welcome, we've been contacted by dairy farmers themselves who were glad that, we, that the industrialisation of their industry and the push for mass production and its impact on welfare was being critically assessed. Change, both immediate and long term, will inevitably rely on the cooperation between farmers, the dairy industry, animal advocates, consumers and government. And it is about not simply accepting the status quo, but to recognise that change is needed. And this is what leads us to our panel session tonight and our selection of panellists. Each of these individuals represent a very important aspect of the dairy debate, working in their own space to bring attention to the modern Australian dairy industry and the treatment of the dairy cow. So, without further ado, our panellists. We have Philip Wallen, a prominent animal welfare advocate and philanthropist. He's an... <laughs> <laughs> Philip is an honorary fellow of the Oxford Centre of Animal Ethics in the UK, and in 2005, he won the Australian of the Year Award for Victoria in recognition for his work of charitable support of charitable causes, but especially for his work in the animal protection movement. Next we have Mo Wise, 
who is co-owner of Smith & Daughters, a vegan restaurant in Fitzroy. <laughs> Moe's Restaurant, Smith & Daughters, was recognised as the People's Choice Award in the 2014 Time Out Food Awards, and she has successfully brought vegan food to the mainstream. We next have Vicky Jones, who runs a small dairy farm in Victoria using organic practices and a farming model that rejects many of the standard farming practices common in Australian dairy. <laughs> and of course we have Dr Deidre Wicks, who is an honorary research associate at Newcastle University and an honorary research fellow at National University of Ireland. Deidre has been a council member for Voiceless since 2010 and she was also an integral part of our Voiceless Dairy report. So please welcome our panellists. Okay, so to get us started I'm going to open with a fairly generic question for our panel and we're going to treat this as a very open discussion between the four members and then with about 20 minutes or so to go we'll then open it up to Q&A from the audience. So to start with, I think I might start with Deidre, all the way down the end. Um, what would you say is your key concern about the production of dairy in Australia? Yes, it, it's hard to separate the issues out and to say what's your key concern, because all the, wealth, all the welfare concerns, in a sense, are related to the push for production and for volume from the, from the cow. And if you look at the three questions that we put in the report to judge the welfare, the animal welfare of the cow, we ask, is the animal functioning well? Is the animal feeling well? Is the animal able to li live a reasonably natural life and express natural behaviours? We see that certainly in intensive dairy, um, there are problems for some of the cows some of the time across those three issues. So there's a lot of welfare problems that relate back to the fact that what we're trying to do is get a lot of milk from one animal. Um, if I was pushed, I would say that the key issue of dairy production, modern dairy production for me, that I find most unacceptable is the whole issue of the separation of the calf from the cow. And, you know, some people can say, oh, look, the cow doesn't mind, it's anthropomorphism, you're imposing your human view on what cows experience. But there is scientific evidence now which looks at heart rates, vocalisations, restlessness that are indicators of great distress. And combined with that is the fate of these little male calves. Most of you probably know that many of the female calves will be used as replacement uh, cows for the herd, but there is really no task, function, for the little boy calves who are known as bobby calves, and approximately 800,000 are sent off to be killed every year in Australia, and I find that actually unacceptable. So that's the, that's the main key welfare issue. Great. For me. So, Vicky, from your perspective as working on the ground, have you seen a development in positive treatment towards bobby calves or what is your take on the bobby calf issue and how it has been handled within the industry? Um, uh, uh, no, I haven't. I think the, the problem with, um, with, with the bobby calves is that they, um, there's nobody representing them, for starters. So I've you know, had conversations with Dairy Australia and with MLA um, about developing markets so that farmers can be encouraged to rear the calves and um, neither of them were interested because it wasn't the area. So, um, so, so basically um, I think farmers are so pushed mm -hmm. that um, there's just no, there's no, and, uh, and I've had farmers say to me that they just, yeah, it's just, they just, it's impossible for them to, to raise them. Uh, and I think the problem is, is there's no um, incentive for them to raise them because there's, there's, um, there's no market, mm -hmm. so. Do you think that, does it lend itself to become then a consumer responsibility to show that they care about bobby cars or do you think change really should come from industry or from farmers? Um, I think with what we've done on the farm, um, it's, it, we've proven that um, the consumers will certainly support it with, without, without, without a doubt. Um, it, I think industry needs to, to spend, that they have a lot of money 
and they could, they could invest some of this money in, in developing markets and encouraging people to, um, to, to, um, to take it on. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, they're not dairy beef. I mean, we're so competitive and we're growing, you know, hormone-grown, grain-fed beef animals that this poor little dairy calf that's not designed to put on massive volumes of weight is um, it, there's just no room for it to to, um, to be seen as a, an economically viable, um, um, I product. suppose, product for, for farmers to grow on, and it's um, yeah, it's really really sad. But we've we've you know we've made changes in our practices, and we've been really well supported by by our community and our consumers, and we've been able to take this horrendous practice and and turn it into something really beautiful and and give these calves a, in fact they have a better life a longer life than what an, the average beef what do you do vicky can you tell oh me? so we um so i've been a dairy farm for 24 years um with and the bobby calves oh yeah sorry so we basically um now um with with our dairy we 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 make the calves our priority so so um we had a system where, where we would retire cows um, to raise, you know, to raise the calves, but um, cows being females and um, being good organisers, basically um, they've taken they've taken charge of the situation. So, because of the bobby calves are, are, are a priority, um, they're not. We don't consider them a waste a waste product. The, we, we allow the cows that do have very strong mothering instincts to raise the calves. So they either let them, they either run in the herd, and that depends on the calf on how um, on. It's hard to explain. Some calves just come in and they've been here before. They just know know the system and and they and they'll run with their mums and it's um, so it's at times we'll have you know, up to 20 or 30 calves running in the herd, and um, and they'll actually uh, when you talk about the emotions, there's there's actually communication happening. So sometimes when the cow is going on the rotary, she'll be talk. You can hear her talking. <laughs> She'll be, you know, she'll be like, you know, mooing, and then, and you'll hear the calf going, "Yep, it's okay, Mum, I'm over here." <laughs> so, um, the, yeah, they do. There is um, a very strong bond. Some, um, some of the calves um, go, um, go. We actually have cows. We have cows that we retire. Um, oh, we try. Sorry. We they either stay in the herd with the mums, or they go. They go out on on. We generally put two calves on a cow, and they go out and they run, run in another herd. So we've got it at the moment. I think about 40 cows that are raising calves. So that's just part of our part of our model. Um, so how, how unusual is that model? Do you find compared to say conventional dairy? Oh yeah, it's. I don't think there's. I think what what made it possible for us was was um, having a community that supported us. Okay. Um, we've got a much stronger farm gate price, and um, and. Um, so, so that's actually what's made it made it possible. Um, okay. That's, yeah, it's friends. interesting to talk about the uh, pressure of farm gate prices. So, if is that something that is more driven by consumers or industry? I wonder, Philip, if you have some insights on that about the idea about consumer or market demand and how that is eventually transferred into pressure on the animal. Dairy farmers would not produce a single liter of milk if consumers didn't buy it. You want to improve this industry? Stop demanding milk. That's that's uh, that's it at, at its core. Mm -hmm. It all starts with a customer. But dairy dairy farmers are in business, and they're there to satisfy our needs. If we don't demand it, they'd find something better to do, and make more money out of it in the process. And we would be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, Mo. From a, a I suppose a vegan retailer perspective. How have you found consumers responding to Smith & Daughters? Because it's not your typical vegan restaurant. It's actually just a very cool, hip restaurant in, that happens to be vegan. So how have you found people respond to your vegan menu? Well, it's really interesting because I think the proof is in the pudding. We have 120 seats. They're filled every single night that we're open, six days a week, sometimes twice and sometimes three times over. Mm -hmm. We're selling about 400 meals a night. So. I think that that says it in itself how people are receiving it. And I think the more interesting thing is we're not taking polls or anything at the end of the night, but if you look around the audience and you look at sort of the interactions that our staff are having with the customers, 75, 80% of the customers are nowhere near being vegetarian. They're there because, why? Because mainstream media has covered us. We won some awards. Their nagging vegan partner brought them there. Their child, who's that, always been that uh, isolated vegan in the family, brought them there. <laughs> and I 
think that is really amazing. So basically, my business partner, Shannon, and I, we got our heads together, and what we said was, we're going to make a restaurant that's accessible. Something that's not about what's not there, but what is there. And, and the key is not using the word vegan. It's, it's a shame, but using the words plant-based, or just saying it's good food that also happens to be vegan, so that people are coming in with no predisposition. They're coming in for a good time, a great cocktail, and they're also leaving, and some of them maybe not even knowing that they ate at a vegan restaurant. They had a really great omelet or a really great sour, whatever it might be that, you know, there was eggs in that. I know, I know there was eggs in that. So the point of uh, our whole mission was, was to really be that, you know, undeniable, if it's good and they've eaten it. I mean, some people say the, the way to someone's heart is through their stomach, and I think that's true. I think there's something very undeniable and um, maybe a bit sad about human nature that mm -hmm. it has to be a very selfish thing. They have to take it on themselves to make those changes. So if they've had a great meal, then maybe they'll make mm -hmm. some changes at home, maybe they'll look up some other recipes, maybe mm -hmm. they'll look into alternatives on their own, but I think sort of going back to what everyone else has said, I think it's all about awareness. I mean, the consumer is the only person that can stop demand, but what about the dietitian authority of Australia that's telling us that we need to have 2.5 to four servings of dairy a day? And I mean, it, I, I hear the words every day, regular and normal. Oh no, I'll just have a cappuccino with regular milk. What's regular about drinking milk from another species? <laughs> Um, there's not really anything normal about that, but we do have soy and almond and coconut and oat and hazelnut and no, no, just regular milk. No, no, but so using positive language and mm. maybe turning someone's, you know, thought process around. Yeah. And we see it all. We see, we see the whole gamut of people <laughs> who are totally resistant and then people who are willing to have an open mind. That's actually, it's very interesting what you bring up about the influence of industry like dairy and whatnot. Um, Deidre, I know that in our research for the report we came across some fairly interesting statistics about influential parties. Um, are you able to elaborate on that sort of partnership? Yes, well it's a little disconcerting that some of our national dietary bodies have as their sponsors major uh, dairy associated companies and um, it's interesting even though a lot of those like the Dietetics Association still recommend a certain amount of dairy. The NH and MRC, their latest report actually refers to the need to have so many servings a day of dairy or alternatives. So that's been a big change. That was the first time that's ever happened, wasn't it? That's right. Mm. Um, but it, it, it is worrying. I mean, they argue, the Dietetics Association argue that they keep that sponsorship separate from their um, overall philosophy and research, but it's not a good look, you know? It, it's a little bit mm. dodgy, and uh, I don't think it's a good thing. I mean, for any organisation to have vested interests mm. uh, investing in them. Yeah. Well, that, that leads me to sort of a question about transparency, and to sort of bring it back to uh, welfare, or the dairy cow, I should say. Um, I might just try to get a little personal. So, Philip, um, what raised your initial concerns about dairy? Like, what sort of what sort of piqued your interest? Because what we found in the report is the vast majority of people have no idea they should even be concerned about dairy cows. So, what, could you give us a bit of insight into yourself? I, I was a merchant banker, and my sorry to tell you this, but my favourite food in those days was filly mignon and lobster. A fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. And my experience in the slaughterhouses changed me to getting off uh, eating meat at all. And then I was on a business trip to India, and I watched as a dairyman dragged his terrified cow, who had been badly injured in an accident with a lorry and broken her spine. He dragged her to the gates of the slaughterhouse, getting her to move by throwing chili powder into her eyes. And alongside her was her bedraggled, starving calf. And before he handed over the, the cow to the slaughterman, the bastard milked her. Uh -uh. If that doesn't change the heart of a man, I'm going to tell you nothing will. 
it affected me profoundly. And this was in India, a nation of Hindus and Jains who profess to worship the cow. Let's remember that India has the world's largest dairy herd. Okay? So when I came back, and I come from the bush, so I'm going to be blunt, and my attention span for nonsense is two nanoseconds. I saw cows being forcibly impregnated, I saw dehorning, disbudding, induction, tail docking, lameless, mastitis. I saw bobby calves being taken away from their grieving mothers. All new to me. I didn't have a clue before that. Saw them starved, loaded onto transport trucks, and taken to slaughter at the age of four days old, away from their grieving mothers. And so-called unviable calves created for management purposes. They were killed. And I watched as someone would smash their heads in with a hammer or jump on their ribs and crush their hearts. That's how they were killed. So, this is what made me decide to look into the dairy industry in great depth. And um, I know it's going to be a very difficult task because, like, I'm going to speak like a merchant banker now, there are big barriers to every industry to get into the industry. But there are also big exit barriers. So I, I always cut the farmers a lot of slack because they've got a lot invested in there and we need to make the tr transition a way more palatable. And that's part of what I'd like, if I get, the, if I get asked the question, I'll talk about. Uh, <laughs> and uh, perhaps I will. <laughs> so that's what brought me to the, to, to the dairy industry, amongst other things. Well, you've left me no choice. I simply <laughs> must ask, what would you see as being then a transition period or transition process for dairy farmers? It takes the, the consumer, if, we, if, the, if farmers generally, and, and please remember dairy is the other side of the coin of the meat industry. They're both inextricably tied together, okay? So any criticisms we make of the dairy industry, we could make with equal force against the meat industry. Let's not just pick on dairy for that purpose. Um, we have great resources here in Australia. We now know with absolute certainty that livestock causes more devastation than any other force vector in the environment. Um, livestock releases more greenhouse gas emissions than all of transport put together. Cars, trains, buses, ships, a lot. By 2048, all our fisheries are going to be dead, poisoned by the runoff from our agricultural industries into the oceans. And we've got lots of land, good weather, good systems. We can be the food bowl of the world. And I'm going to tell you that Farmers actually are the ones with the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line will change. Farmers will make so much money they wouldn't even bother counting it, and I'll be the first to congratulate them. New industries would emerge and, and flourish. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we'd be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. So, and if you, and at some stage, someone's going to talk about the effect of dairy on human health. I just noticed there's a man in the audience, a gentleman, who is probably one of the world's most renowned authorities on human health um, and dairy. His name is Mark Donadue, and he's somewhere here. If anyone wants to ask, there he is standing there. Um, <laughs> if anyone wants to ask a question, a genuine, interesting question, Please talk to him or maybe at Q&A, Mark, and say a few words as well. Anyway. Well, that's very... So, Vicky, as, as a dairy farmer who initially started on a conventional dairy farm, the kind of farms that we were talking about in the report, how do you find... Um, how has the transition been, I should say, from a conventional farm to the operation system you have now? And do you see that being as potentially the industry norm? And would there potentially be a transition completely away from that again? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, um, we've, we've, our farm originally, um, we've got 600 acres in total, uh, which originally milked 800 cows. Um, we've, we've cut that down to um, a milking about 120 cows um, to make room for, you know, running the extra stock. But yeah, I, I think, I actually think farmers would embrace what you're saying. I think they've had a gut full of the industry, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It, um, it, it's, oh gosh, I mean, it, 
It eats at the, it's, it's, I mean, 98% of the farms in Australia are family owned. The reason that people are drinking milk is because they live on slave labour. Farmers are, are basically enslaved. Um, in fact, they're not, they're worse than slaves because they're actually going into debt to produce milk. And that's how the industry is surviving. A dollar a litre milk, it's coming at a cost. Um, the cost to the calves, to the cows, um, and to people's lives. We lose one farm every four days. You know, and, and, and the, the supermarkets can sit there and these big factories can sit there and, and, and make contracts with, with Coles and Woolies for 10 years to supply them with, with a dollar a litre of milk. milk. How, how can that be sustained? I think farmers, if you came up with a solution, I think they'd embrace it. Mm. Well, can I just add one, two sentences if I may? <laughs> I used to act for one of Australia's truly great politicians. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? <laughs> but he was the president, he was the leader of the National Party years ago. A wonderful, I think he's still alive, uh, Peter Nixon. And he said something to me, he was a deputy prime minister as well. He was a client of mine. And uh, he once said, Phil, you've got to understand that farmers are actually very smart. They've got nothing to do all day but sit on the, tra on the tractor and think. And that's true. They, they are smart. And they will respond well if they, if they handled correctly. Um, I have a lot of, lot of faith in them. Um, and just on the fact of numbers, we're, we're now entering a new kind of paradigm with climate change. And regardless of what Tony Abbott tells you, climate change is, is something real. I, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's real. Um, we just come back recently from India. Um, you all know that livestock, is a pro, uh, particularly dairy, is a profligate waster of water particularly in a country like Australia where we don't have a lot of water. And water is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. I hear one way of expressing it is to say that it takes 1,000 litres of water to produce one litre of milk. And what does a farmer get for it? Something like 50 cents a litre and about 7 cents for, for, um, for solids. Now, that's not a hell of a lot of money for the amount of trouble he goes through, the damage he does to the environment, the, very importantly to the damage he does to uh, um, the cows and their calves and to human health. So every industry in the world undergoes rationalization. Uh, textiles, clothing, footwear, banking, mining, every one of them. This industry will be rationalized too. I think we should st step up to the plate or to the crease and take the initiative and start the process now find other alternatives, like uh, different forms of milk, you know, like soy being, being one, almond milk, oat milk. Uh, there are so many different kinds, and the profit margins are so much better, the wastage ratios are so much lower, and the cash flow forecasts are robust. So I see farmers having so many great opportunities. I just wish I was younger and I could get involved in this transition of this industry. It would be a real fun place to be. Oh, come on, you've got plenty of time, I promise. So to, um, to change tack again now, so we're talking about the pressure being put on the farmer and the low cost that they're getting. To bring it back to the dairy cow, in response to our report, we were talking about how the amount of litres per milk per day um, a calf is, a cow, I should rather, is forced to produce. And the industry av average is between 50 and, sorry, 30 and 50 litres per day but there was also mention of cows being pushed up to 60 litres per day. Now, in response to our findings, it was said the cows are now fully equipped to handle this, there's better feed, there's better technology, this is not an animal who's overworked. However, I cannot help but be aghast at the idea of a cow being forced to 60 litres of milk per day. Um, Deidre, do you have any comments on that? Well, just that uh, we did a lot of research, obviously, for the report, and the world-renowned dairy expert, John Webster, he talks about the cow as being the apocryphal overworked mother. Um, and he actually argues that in many instances, it's almost impossible for the cow to eat enough to cover her own nutritional needs plus producing that amount of milk. And the only way it can be done is first, firstly by breeding a cow that's programmed for that, and secondly with um, supplementary feeding. And Phillips just talked about all the problems associated with, uh, well some of the problems associated with that. 
So I, I think um, John Webster has shown that it's a problem for the cow. And it also means that the cow has a shorter life. I mean, it's, it's going at maximum production for a much shorter period. So instead of a natural lifespan, a cow can live to 25 years. Um, these cows generally uh, don't go beyond five years. They don't go into calf, they're sent off to be killed. So I think it is, it is a problem. And uh, I think it's a problem for the cow, I think it's a problem for the farmer because the farmer then has to buy all these expensive feeds and it's a problem for the environment because those grains are being used in a very inefficient way. Vicky, I understand that um, you've either seen firsthand or through some of your um, farming colleagues a cow who does produce 60 litres and can you tell us about some of the welfare that you've witnessed in particular with the, the ligaments around her udder? Oh yeah, so they, they, they breed these cows to produce massive amounts of milk. Um, the problem, and this is why they have, part of the reason why they have a short lifespan is that, um, unless, I mean they're obviously trying to breed, the, um, the ligament that, that holds the, the bag together um, literally just, just collapses, just breaks. So you have this cow, and we've had them in the past, we had the high producing cows and we were feeding them a amazing nutritional, you know, mixes and, and um, a lot of people did very well out of us. And we, we made, we produce a lot of milk. Mm. But um, yeah, it's, uh, we've, we've moved away from that and I wouldn't go back there again because it's, it's not sustainable. But um, so what, yeah, so what happens is, is basically the, the, this beautiful big udder that carries this massive amount of milk, um, the ligament breaks and, and then she's got this udder that's dragging on the ground and, and then you basically, they, well you just chop, you chop her head off, they chop her head off. So. Mm. She's, um, and that's why often these, these high producing cows will only have a, um, probably a couple of, just a couple of lactations in the herd. A lot of the big farms, I've been told by people that work in them, that, um, that after two lactations they're, they're out. So, um, mm. yeah. I know so, Mo, you've had a, a very strong response to... Well, it just seems the problem is awareness and it seems like most Australians, Americans, everyone in the world are picturing Vicky's farm as where your milk comes from, uh, Vicky's current farm. And it's amazing to hear words like equipped and uh, nutritious feed. I mean, it's, it's as if we're feeding a machine, not an animal. And it's this verbiage that's just treating us like an actual living, breathing, feeling, emotional being as a product to get another product. And there's so many things to go into, but there's this great quote that man will always come up with a solution to tamper with nature to get what man wants. I mean, it is shocking to, to come up with solutions to combat problems to just produce this liter of milk. But it's amazing you say, you know, this nutritious grain to feed these cows. What about the grain to feed the human? Just cut out the cow and just feed the human the grain. I mean, it's, it's amazing disconnect between human and animal and the fact that the animal is now treated like the piece of machinery that's used to milk it. I mean, it's, it's no longer an animal. So I think I might open a question to the panel then and just sort of say, in general, where do you think the responsibility for I'll say better protection of the dairy cow, because I have a feeling we probably all have a different idea of welfare or the use or abuse of dairy cows. So where do you f see, feel responsibility truly lies if we want to change how the industry is currently being operated? Oh. Open, open to oh, the floor. The consumer demand. I think you, I mean, we see it with the eggs. I mean, I don't think there's probably a person in this room that buys cage eggs, is there? Okay. Yeah, put your um, hand up. Yeah. <laughs> put your hand up if you do. <laughs> um, and, and we see what's happening now. Supermarkets are now, you know, stocking free-range eggs. And I mean, it's still a lot of work to be done with that because you know there's free-range and then there's free-range. And um, but there are some really beautiful egg producers that let their chickens, you know, run in paddocks. And and so um, and that's consumer-driven. So um, I think there's got to be education, um, and then consumer-driven. And consumers um, have to be understand that you know the cheap milks. You, you, you can't have a, a, a good practice. Um, you know, you can't run the high stocking rates. We run a, a stocking rate of one cow to a hectare. A good farmer in my area will run four cows to a hectare. So um, we, we can't, we can't um, produce a product 
for, for what the, the, the system is paying. It's not sustainable. So um, the consumer's got to got to drive it, um, and you and you will get it. And then you can. Um, I think you know. I'd love to see. I would love to see farms, dairy farms, growing for more food. You know, less cows. Cut the cows back. Um, if people obviously would. would I mean, the ultimate, your dream, and maybe that will happen in, in the future. But um, I think the start, to start, the start would be to, to let's cut the herds back. I know some beautiful farmers that milk very small herds, um, and they grow, you know, then they grow other other food products, and um, and they have and they and they feed, you know, communities, um, and they love their cows. You know, I'm talking about herds of 12 and 25 and 50 cows, like. That's, we don't need these big, big thousand cow farms. These thousand cow farms, I mean, I mean, I've been doing a bit of research and talking to people because I mean, I haven't been on one. And you know, basically, if that cow, they say, um, there's no time. If the cow goes down or anything, that's it. She's she's dead. She's gone. No one has time to look to look after him. I spoke to a neighbour of mine um, yesterday. He milks, I think he milks 50 cows, and um, you know, he and I actually asked his opinion, but he said, Vicky, I love my cows. I love my cows, and they live till 12, 15 years old, and um, you know, I, I work with them every day. I give him a pat on the back, and and you know, he's 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 what's going, he's what's leaving the industry, and what's taking over is, is farmers can't afford to buy these big farms. Um, to buy farms, and, and, and who could afford to buy a farm to milk 50 cows or 20 cows? So cons consumers have to understand that um, you've got to pay more for the product and, and support the farmers. I start asking the question, we don't have this in the, milk, in, the, in, in the industry, you can buy you know, low fat, 2%, you have all those choices, but you can't go and say, um, there's not, nothing saying this, this milk has been produced by an ethical, um, an ethical organic. I mean, I think, I don't know what, um, what Phil's opinion on organics is, but I certainly think um, you know it's got to. Be, if you go down this path, you, organics are, um, uh, it has to be organic because if we if, if we want to save the planet, we can't. We've got to stop using chemicals. And I don't know what your opinion on GMOs, but that's another <laughs> another time and another topic. But um, and what we've found by by you know reducing all the chemicals and and um, you know reducing the stocking rates, we've got really healthy animals. And when we're feeding people, and, and the people are healthy. So, um, yeah, I think the tra transition is consumer support. Let's reduce the herd sizes, and and forget the industry. They're not interested. They have not. They're not interested. In, I'm sorry if anyone from Jerry Australia is here, um, but I've tried to talk to you guys, and you, you know, you, you're not interested in in in, this, in going this direction. You, you're looking at volumes and export markets and feeding masses and. Um, competing globally, you know, we're sending milk. We were sending milk to America. We, we were going through a drought in 2006, 2007. We were sending milk to America and undercutting their farmers. And, and their farmers were going broke. Like, where's the logic in that? No. It's psychopathic, seriously. Mm. You know, we should be doing that. They should, we should let them look after their, their communities and, and we should be looking after our farmers. And, and, and it's not by milking big herds because I know farmers that milk the 60 litre cows, they have the robotic dairies, they everything, you name it, and they're going broke. They're going broke, and they're, and they're not happy people. So, um, yeah, sorry. So, Deidre, do you have a response to that? Yeah, um, well, it's more a comment, and it may be um, a comment which some people don't agree with, which is fine, because hopefully there'll be some responses in the discussion. But um, putting my sociologist, anthropologist, hat on, I see dairy as a very, very ingrained part of our food culture. And it's very hard to change culture and very hard to change food culture. And it's something that will be very, very slow. And I see uh, the sort of farm that Vicky is operating as a really, really important part of moving away from mass production dairy. I think it's very hard for a lot of people to even envisage a life without dairy food. And my view is that dairy, as part of the transition, needs to be seen as a luxury product. Um, it's, you know, these millions of litres of milk that get poured out as waste um, it's obscene. This is a very precious product. This is from the mammary gland of a mammal. 
I mean, and anyone that's nursed a child knows how precious that is. And if we're going to use it, we have to have the greatest respect for the product and for the animal that it's coming from and try and have some kind of social contract whereby the animal also gets something out of this, that it's not just exploitation. So I see raising awareness as absolutely crucial because most people don't know the reality behind dairy. And I think that's the first thing. And then offering them alternatives, organic dairy, alternatives to milk like soy and all the other kinds is part of that. But I think the first thing is having a discussion about it because it's, there's just been silence. And milk has been the norm. I mean, those old, old enough like myself to have grown up in the days where milk was delivered to the school and you were forced to drink it um, will remember that that was just normal. Milk bars were normal. Um, it's all part of our culture and it's not going to go away in a hurry. The other thing I think we have to remember too is for dairy farmers, that dairy farm is their home and they've often live there generation after generation. And that's a very hard thing. They're trying to hold on with the banks on the one side, the milk processors negotiating low prices on the other. You know, if we're going to have a transition, we have to do it in a consultative way with farmers and a, a humane way. Okay, that's it. I think we're going to open to Q&A in just a minute, but I'd like to just get a final statement from both Mo and um, Philip, please, just to sort of sum up what your thoughts are on what people can do, whose responsibility it is. I'll go first, because you're yeah. going to say something very profound. <laughs> <laughs> so you should finish on that note. So it's funny because... Oh, <laughs> When Deidre was saying luxury product, I was just imagining milk with those amazing cigarette packets with the, the truth about cigarettes on them and how great that would be. This is the truth behind your milk. And really and truly that it's the industry and the government's responsibility to look out for its citizens. So why not tell them exactly what they're drinking and let them make their own decisions? And hopefully that would mean that they would turn to those alternatives. A great fact, and this is another one that I found, Almond Breeze, everyone's aware of that brand, Blue Diamond, they are projected to make greater sales in, in the US than skim milk at the end of this year. So there is changes being made, consumers are becoming more aware. I think uh, change is very hard for most people. It's why Beyonce is so great, go Beyonce. I think people have a lot of celebrity worship uh, and if that's what it takes, really and truly. Man, I never thought I would be giving Beyonce a shout out, but... Uh, <laughs> Really and truly, whatever it is, I think it does have to come from a personal place. I think people, as consumers, have to have an interaction. Their mother gets sick, something happens to them where they really have to take it on board themselves. It's not someone shoving a pamphlet in their face, sadly, because, man, I can shove pamphlets in people's faces. But I think that there is something very selfish about the decisions being made, so I think it's industry and government's responsibility to look out for their citizens Tell them exactly what's going on. Look out for people actually trying to make change. And just that there is a, a right horizon with people actually becoming aware and, and taking those things on board. Great. Philip? You just mentioned uh, health, which is quite an important issue. Um, in the United States, lifestyle diseases caused by the meat and dairy industry has now bankrupted that country through Medicare. They would need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest. And they have precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, marines, air force, homeland security, FBI, and CIA, and they still will not have enough free cash flow to service their long-term unfunded Medicare liabilities because of the kinds of food they eat. Now, please go back tonight, those of you who haven't already, and read stuff written by T. Colin Campbell or the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. These issues are canvassed in, in quite good detail. Quite recently, I had dinner with Muhammad Yunus after he won the Nobel Peace Prize. 
And roughly about the same time, I was delivering a speech to a whole bunch of Indian entrepreneurs in New Delhi. And in the audience was Amartya Sen, who just won the Nobel in economics. And I discussed with these gentlemen the things that I discussed to, with everybody here, largely about the livestock industry in India. And I said that we know the problems with climate change. The Himalayan uh, ice fields, icebergs up there, are correctly called the third pole because they feed half the world's population through the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, through the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Yellow Rivers, and these icebergs are melting fast. I asked them what was their opinion, and they said, we agree with you 100%. These Nobel, Pri even Al Gore agreed with us. Now, these Nobel Prize winners have no argument with what rational people are saying about the livestock industry. But I get a lot of arguments from politicians who want to get re-elected re at the next election. So I think then we need to, uh, people like us, good, decent people of, of, of integrity, have got to come together and say, there's a new world out there, we've got to behave differently. In human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven billion people are alive today. And we torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every three hours. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a bloody virus. So let's all come together. Let's not pick on specific industries. How can we work together to create a new environment, a new economic order that gives us health, wealth, strength, and preserves our own sense of kindness, compassion, intelligence, affection? These things are important values. Then we can start talking about sustainability, because then we would have deserved to become sustainable. Until, until then, we don't actually deserve it. Okay, so we now have time for some audience Q&A. Um, if you could please raise your hand and one of our staff will come around with a microphone. Um, just so we can hear as many people as possible, please no comments at this stage um, and just questions. And, and um, also just please speak into the microphone because it's actually being recorded tonight. Thank you. question for Vicky, actually. I'm just interested to know how um, the process line works in terms of do you share the milk, do you distribute the milk amongst the calves and the human consumers? And how viable is your farming process? Um, the oh, the, the calves that, um, so we have some calves that run in the herd with the mums okay. and they pretty much just take what they need and we, we take what's left. Um, that's not the whole of the herd. That's, um, the, the balance of the calves are raised on, on cows that actually, um, we call them nanny cows. So we, um, she generally, because she's got more milk than a beef cow, she generally raises two calves and they go off. So, um, so um, how, how, how do we, um, we, we, have a community, we have a community of about 360 families that um, we um, supply with, with um, produce from the farm. And um, we get a much, um, probably more, um, a farm gate price that reflects the, the input costs. So, um, and that's pretty much how we can sustain what we're doing. Um, we certainly couldn't do it on the current milk prices that um, dairy farmers are getting paid at the moment. So I think that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, the Ningbo Dairy Company from China has bought five um, ordinary sized farms and is proposing 
to milk cows through a, a feedlot system. Mm. The local farmers are appalled um, and say it's not the Aussie way. Um, I'm dubious about um, a lot of local dairy farms anyway, but is there cause for concern about um, big Chinese dairy companies coming in? And I'm not sure who this question is addressed to. Well, just to start it off, I think there's concern about intensification of dairying, no matter who the the um, the or no matter where the origin of the company. And um, Elise said earlier that at the moment it's around two percent of dairy farms are um, based on. Um, feeds and you know grains rather than pasture the problem is that if we're not careful that's going to expand mm -hmm. and what you're talking about is an example of that so i think it is cause for concern mm -hmm. they're buying land up everywhere the the chinese so um and and they're just um i can see i know the farmers aren't happy about it but they're just securing food for the country or businesses are investing over here. Um, I don't know whether it'll be interesting because um, even if they bring their people over here to work, they're still got to pay them. So, you know, I don't know what'll happen when they hit a few hard, big droughts or um, whether, how, how they'll actually survive. Um, it'll be, it, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, I know they're building their own factories as well and um, if they've got control over the pricing and um, I, I read somewhere where they were talking about milk um, producing more milk, they didn't think, um, and getting better prices. They, they've actually acknowledged that farmers aren't getting paid enough. Um, you know, input costs are greater than output costs. So um, if, they, if they change that, but yeah, it is, they, they, they're just securing their food. Um, but unfortunately, it's going to come at a cost. So if I could just add a little bit to that. I was in China a couple of years ago and I spoke to some e economists and people like that. And they talked about China buying up vast properties in Africa. They actually call that, that part of the world China 2, and China 3 is Australia. Uh, they, call, they make it in a flippant sort of way. And Muhammad Yunus actually, I, I threw a line at him and said that if climate change is really happening because of the livestock industry, all the good that you have done with Grameen Bank will vanish when Bangladesh drowns. And he said, to say nothing about Ho Chi Minh City, Calcutta, Manila, Bombay, and, and the rest of, of these places. Um, but I, I do think that um, China is considered the big bogeyman, but one thing I'll give them credit for, once they make up their mind to do something good or bad, they do it. The trick is to get them to do something good. Mm. And if they do it, it'll happen yesterday. So I, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> Right, I've sort of forgotten my question in amongst all of that because it, it was also about um, the concern with the free trade agreement and the massive produ production of dairy that um, you know, China and Asia are expecting from Australia and, and how much pressure that will put on our environment, mm. not to mention all of the animals and, and all that comes from that. And so maybe you know, reading the China study by T. Campbell and you know, can we, they want to be more like the West, yet they were so much healthier before they were more like us. And, and is it about getting their national pride back that they had it right in the first place? You know, is, that, is there some way to do that? Partly there's a problem uh, with development in, and industrialisation with China because part of the demand is for infant formula. Mm. And uh, because most of you will be aware that there was a big scandal uh, in China because the infant formula had been tampered with as in an attempt to increase the protein level and babies were poisoned and some died and many were um, made very sick. So they're looking to Australia and to New Zealand and to other countries for reliable, clean, green uh, powdered milk and infant formula. And what's happening there is that so many women now are going into the workforce. Already it's a very low level of breastfeeding in China. Only 28% of infants um, under six months are breastfed. 
and that is going to become even more pronounced as more women go into the workforce. So that's what's driving a lot of the demand is infant formula. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great idea. Maybe we should send um, those breastfeeding evangelists over to China <laughs> and uh, see how successful they can be. <laughs> so a slightly embarrassing confession to make. Up until about six to eight months ago, I had the incorrect perception in my mind as to why vegans didn't drink milk. And it was only when I found out why they didn't that it actually started to make sense. And I'm pescatarian, I haven't eaten meat for 15 years. Um, I make ethical decisions about the fish I eat, the eggs I eat. So as far as society in general goes, I'm a little bit ahead of the curve as far as making decisions on what I eat. Since I found that out, it's changed my whole way of thinking and I often address the issue with friends, discussing it, and people, everyone on the panel so far has said, change starts with the consumer. The consumer has, part of my language, no bloody idea as to what goes on, all right? And like I said, I had no idea, and I haven't eaten meat for 15 years. When I talk to friends and explain this to them, their first reaction is, I don't want to hear about it, I don't need to know, you know, I just buy the milk, what goes on at the farm, it's got nothing to do with me, I just buy the milk. And they have no idea what it's all about. So educating the consumer, as Phil definitely said, that it, that's number one step, and DJ also mentioned it as well, it's going to be a battle because they don't want to know about it, they definitely don't want to know about it, and they have no idea whatsoever. Um, yeah, as it, it's changed my way of thinking, I'm more happy to eat fish and eggs than I am cheese now, just simply because I know that the eggs have come from a chicken that's run around and lived a life. Most of the fish I eat have swum and lived a life as well, but the milk that I was having and the cheese I was having was coming as a result of torture. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's gonna be a battle, but um, yeah, consumer has no idea. And, and in the spirit of, as you say, of education, let me just give you a couple of little facts that may help you a little, <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I'm a bigger pescatarian. Um, the Pacific Ocean, the oceans are dying in our time, as I said earlier, by 2048, all our fisheries will be dead, the lungs and the arteries of the earth. The Pacific gyra now is so full of plastic, junk, and human feces, it has created a floating footprint bigger than India. And um, let's remember, a very significant percentage of our fish that, that we consume, that people consume here in Australia, actually come from fish farms. And there's usually a conversion ratio of between eight to one and 15 to one. In other words, for every kilo of fish that you eat, they've killed, say, 10 kilos of wild caught fish to feed that one fish. So you're on the right track, you've got a good intellect, you've got good ethics, you're one or two sh steps away from being perfect, and I welcome you. <laughs> Um, thank you for all your efforts. Um, I'm interested in your views, so to anyone who wants to answer, um, in the role of the worker as a potential advocate for change, particularly in relation to the training and skills that they may or may not get, but also the employment, alternative employment options available to them. labour shortage in the dairy industry and I have seen reports whereby um, the industry is asking to have um, regulations changed so that backpackers will be able to work on dairy farms as part of their required work. Um, now I think that that's the sort of thing that's very worrying because if we want good welfare to start at the farm level, you have to have people who are well trained and uh, they're not just a pair of hands. So I think that's a really important point. I think that there should be qualifications and there should be proper training and it should be recognised. And uh, that's how farms should be run, especially farms that are requiring um, large inputs of labour. No one's questioning where that's coming from. I think it's a really important point. Just to add on that point, I'm sorry to do this, but remember every dairy cow goes and finishes her life in a slaughterhouse. And that animal will be killed by a human being. And let's also remember that the slaughterman has the highest rate of stress 
in any uh, trade in the country. The suicide rates, I don't actually, I'd like to quote the number, but I don't want to get it wrong because the, someone from the press may quote me. Um, but the, the suicide rates for slaughtermen is massive. The stress level, level for people who work in slaughterhouses is astonishingly high. Let's get this welfare issue off the agenda once and for all. Let's take a look at the big picture. Let's get animal products off the menu. And truly, the difference between vegetarianism and veganism is torture and murder. So, I mean, I'm sorry to put it like that, but you're ending the animal's life or you're torturing them for the rest of it. So, I Hello. Um, there's been some talk um, tonight about uh, the consumer in uh, our society and how consumer demands shape... Uh, a, at the end of the line, uh, how the animal is treated. Um, I was um, interested in what Deidre was saying about our culture, and I was, um, and also what else was said about um, greater education, um, greater awareness in our society. However, I think also that uh, maybe um, a greater sense of empathy in our society is also needed. And when I look around this room, I see mainly women. I mean, there's four, uh, three women on the panel, one man. Um, I'm not making any generalisations, um, but I'm just saying <laughs> what I'm trying to say is uh, to what extent is uh, maybe valuing members in our society which, are, which can identify more with animals um, uh, important in shaping how we will uh, treat animals in the future. And I think of women in particular, I think of uh, treating our prime ministers with respect, um, such that as a society, we look to other um, uh, subgroups in society um, with uh, greater value and reverence. How timely, since we're so close to International Women's Day, I must say. <laughs> but you know, your point is actually a whole lot better than you realise. Um, we had meetings with some very important people in, in governments recently, and one of the things that they said to me privately was how offended they, this is overseas, how offended they were by the coarsening, was the word they used, the coarsening of discourse in Australia when a senior politician in the Australian Federal Parliament could say to a woman that she was deliberately barren and she happened to be the Prime Minister of Australia, they, f they said, we felt a sick feeling in our stomach. And I, th I think we've all got to, s to take a deep breath, a becks and a good lie down, and change the way in which we treat, e treat each other, speak to each other, and, um, and not just other human beings, but other species as well. So thank you for bringing up that point. I think we've got time for one or two more. Hi, um, my question's for Vicky. Um, I've got a degree in agriculture science and I actually grew up under heavy debt, so I understand sort of the farmer's situation, but, and now I'm vegan, so it's hard to go back. <laughs> but I guess my question is, what really frustrates me is we're not hearing from farmers about animal welfare issues in dairy, in any livestock industry. And I know there's farmers out there why aren't we hearing from them? Because we're getting intensification of the industry while they're standing by, and that really frustrates me. I would prefer there not to be a livestock agriculture industry, now that I understand veganism, but given that there is, why aren't they standing up? Um, I think the, your, your question is, is probably associated with the previous one. The, the industry is... Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, sorry. The industry is dominated by men. There's, there's I mean, I, I'd often go to dairy, dairy um, meetings with my husband because oh, I'm a hands-on. I'm in there. I'm, I've done everything. Um, I'm not one of the wives that sits at home and, um, you know, not, not that I, I, I know a lot of wives don't actually get involved in the dairy and I'd often be the only female there. And I'd be like, oh, where's all the women? Why aren't they here? And, um, and I think that's, that's, I think, probably the, where the industry is now is because it's dominated by males. And, you know, I asked my husband the other day, like, 
when I when I came into the industry, when I came, you know, I was I was um, I, you know I saw the beautiful grassy picture and the cows, and then when I actually was on the inside, you know, I saw the calf induction and the tail docking, all these ho things that I found horrific as a as a or as a as a person, but as a as a mother, and um, and he. He just said, "Oh, we just didn't think there was anything wrong. You know, they're just a, a male thing. Like, you know, they they were doing their job. They were producing, doing, producing the product as much milk as they could. But they just they just don't have that, I guess, that sense of heart." Okay. I, I really don't think it's a male or female issue, to, to be honest with you. Um, can we just play a little uh, a thought experiment? Okay, one minute. Let's imagine a different kind of world. No animals in factory farms, no pain, no tail docking, no killing uh, unviable calves, no cruelty, better health, better health budgets, cleaner environment, plenty of clean water for everyone. Just imagine that beautiful world, just for one second. Now imagine someone comes up with some bright spark and says, I'll tell you what we'll do, let's go and get that animal called an oryx will muck around with its genes and interbreed that animal and turn it into a cow. And we'll put that cow into a dairy farm and we'll do all these terrible things to it. Send them lame, give them mastitis, take their calves away, give them a dreadful life, consume their milk, not make much money out of it, and um, get sick in the process, screw up our environment. Why don't we do that? Now, I look at you and I see you're aghast. Now, if no one would ever invent such an industry, what kind of person will defend it? I can tell you now that I know something about this. Upton Sinclair got it right. He said it is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. So I think that is the nub. You'll find it very hard to get anyone from any industry, not just the dairy industry. It happens in the coal industry. It happens steel industry in Newcastle. It happens in aviation, aer uh, aviation aerospace industry, the arms industry, the landmine industry. It happens everywhere. Okay? Don't pick on the dairy farmer alone. But when your salary depends on it, you have a natural inertia to fight against any change. That is why we need to be compassionate, intelligent, and persuasive to bring these people into the fold and try and forge a better life for all of us. Great. Yeah. And I think we probably have time for maybe one or two, slightly longer. Yeah, I was just wondering, you said before that, oh, sorry, Philip, um, you said before that um, it's change is consumer driven and um, I know that for, well, for me anyway, I drink organic milk, I used to, except it's um, now legally unavailable. So what sort of change can we as consumers make um, to get the government, because the milk you're talking about in general is actually reconstituted milk. It's reconstituted milk that was dried to a powder and reconstituted to liquid that that forces the industry the way it is, the way farmers operate at the moment. They're making reconstituted milk on a grand scale. On the small scale, the organic milk farmers, they produce, I think they quite gently and kindly produce good food for average people. You know, um, I know in Ireland they used to, if you had three cows, you're a rich man. Same, as, same thing in Switzerland. If you had three cows, you know, you had everything. That's all you used to need. And, um, you know, can we change the government so that we can get back to that sort of a regime? You know, I, you know, I travel all around the world and I speak to thousands and thousands of people. They're all good, decent, ethical people like all of you. And they all genuinely want to change the world as long as they don't have to change themselves. But life doesn't work that way. First we change in our hearts, and then the world follows. So let's, let's us change. We'll never reach an economic state of being able to, for a farmer to have two or three cows. 
the cost structures would just blow that out of, out of, out of the, the market. You could, not, you could not pay for the milk that's produced. And let's not call milk food. It is food, but for a calf, not for us. So uh, I, I, I would say um, let's just get it off our agenda. It's the cleanest, simplest, and most effective way. And um, the future is looking very bright. I, I see more and more people coming to this realization. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Oh, is it back there? Sorry to take the last question from other people. Um, my question, I asked a dairy farmer about the low prices and he said to me that, that, um, that the low prices in Australia weren't such an issue because really the bulk of of the money that goes into dairy is from sending milk powder, over, milk powder overseas. So I wanted to ask one whether that's that's the case, and if so, then what can be done about that? Because surely that's what's putting the squeeze. If that's the case, that's what's putting the squeeze on farmers to do what they're doing. Well, it, it differs from state to state. In New South Wales, the bulk of the milk goes into drinking milk. Victoria, um, it's dominated by powdered milk and milk production. But who determines the price are the milk processors and manufacturers in conjunction with the supermarkets. Um, and it used to be traditional that the processors were cooperatives under the control of the dairy farmers. But that's changing now and they have a corporate structure and they're answerable to investors. So they're looking all the time to maximise their profit and the dairy farmer is completely squeezed between them on the one hand and the banks on the other. So Australia's quite diverse about um, what it produces, what kind of milk it produces and where it goes to. But certainly these processes have got their eyes on the Asian market and the demand there for powdered and manufactured milk, and not just milk, also nutraceuticals. I mean, on one side of the demographic divide, you've got bone supplements, and on the other side, you've got all these young guys in particular wanting protein shakes to build muscle. And that's an enormous uh, growth area in the Asia Pacific. Um, region. So the problem is, I mean, Phil says there's a lot of people coming to this consciousness. At the same time, I see these massive economic pressures going in absolutely the opposite direction of pushing for um, consolidation, rationalisation, overproduction, productivity, so we can make these masses of dollars on the international market. That's, that's what I worry about. Is there any final comments before we wrap up from the panel? Um, I just, just with that, I just want to say that um, we, ex we export 40%. I think we used to, a few years ago, we were exporting 70% of milk from Victoria. Um, we dropped down to 40%. Um, the problem with the way the milk is priced is it's a supply and demand. So um, last year and the year before, supply the demand had in, was was um, supply was. Um, lower than demand um, at the moment. So the factories told the farmers to produce more milk and so now we're producing too much milk and um, the prices are... So I think at the moment we're looking at a price, the farmers looking at a price drop. So it's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous pricing system and, and, and it's probably what is pushing for, for this, this mentality that um, we've got to produce more milk, prices go down. But I, I think it might be changing now, but what farmers used to do was when prices dropped, we've got to, milk, we've got to produce more milk and work on smaller margins. And um, I think that's, it's, it's probably got, got to a point now where um, they're running out of equity in the farms, the banks are, are clamping down. And one thing I've got to say to you guys, where you put your money, um, I think that's, that's something else that farmers need to support, especially if we want to change to, to, to models where we've got, you know, growing other products and, 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 a, and different, because banks, and banks want, and our bank was the same. We were milking 400 cows, they wanted us to milk 500 cows. We went to drop down to 120, we were more profitable, but we didn't, we didn't tick all the little boxes and all of a sudden we were high risk, so they put our interest rates up. So we went up from two, we went up 2% in 2012, in 2013 we were paying 18%. And I tell you what, that is, um, you know, just about killed us. So um, 
think about where your food comes from, think about where, you, where you're investing your money as well. You know, you can support farmers purely just by investing in, in I'm not even sure that if there's banks that actually do. I think there's, there's, there's talk now of, 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 of investments where we can support farmers that can make, make changes that, you know, can, can move in, in the other direction, so. So, Mo, any final statement from you? <laughs> Beyonce. No, Beyonce. Uh, I think the main, the main concern that it's sounding like is, is the consumer and the awareness involved. But I think really and truly it has to come, actually by, sorry to plug you guys, but like reading, totally reading a report <laughs> like this and edu you know handing it to someone who really may not know, who may not have that light switched on for them, and really and truly befriend people with influence because they can speak louder and to more people and it just goes and goes and goes. But I have a bit of a fatalistic uh, sort of idea that it's, it has to come from those greater places. It has to come from government. It has to come from industry. And they really need to take accountability and responsibility for what they're literally poisoning people. And yeah. All right, Philip, any final comments? <laughs> The Premier of South Australia was a gentleman named Steele Hall many years ago, and he said the fundamental objective of every political party is to win office. How we do it doesn't really matter. Okay. Everything does ultimately, the buck stops with us, so with the consumer, but we're also voters, and we also have friends and families and colleagues. I don't just want everyone to get off the meat and dairy drug, and let's, there's evidence to show that it is actually a drug. I don't just want you to do that. I actually want you to become activists. So take the initiative, speak to your friends, speak to members of parliament, like the bad guys do. I mean, if you look at the pharmaceutical industries, they, can, they get away with blue murder, and they've worn out the carpet in parliament house. So I think good, decent people like you, um, we shouldn't be, like Voltaire said, you know, uh, the French rant and rave against the government, eat their dinner and go to bed. We're not French. So let's become proactive, let's become activists, and uh, let's try to do something tangible with what's left of our lives. Okay, so that concludes our seminar for this evening. And please uh, join me in a well. Ah, a round of applause, I should say, for our wonderful panellists. Thank you so much. <laughs> so if you're interested in finding out more about Voiceless Dairy or the Voices Rethinking seminars, please visit our website or speak to some of the Voiceless staff here this evening. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And for any lawyers in the room, we also have Voiceless Law Talk on Facebook, which is a great um, legal community for Australia. Uh, also, warm thank you to our sponsors, the Wine by Six Parallel South, um, the Tree Nut Cheeses by Sprout and Kernel, and the Delicious Chocolates by Sweet William, all vegan, by the way. And a big thank you again to our wonderful panellists, and really, thank you to you. Thank you for coming tonight to talk about this really important issue, and give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.